Welcome back. Let's look at LU and LDU factorizations, section 5.6. Uh, these notes are largely from uh, my favorite linear algebra book, Fraley and Beauregard's um, Linear Algebra. I've got a link directly to uh, some of my linear algebra notes. I have sort of beefed up these notes a bit and referred to uh, some of the results from this class. As we know a bunch of stuff about uh, matrices and matrix multiplication and so forth at this stage. So what we're going to do is take a given matrix with satisfying certain conditions and write it as a product of a lower triangular matrix and an upper triangular matrix. Maybe as a lower triangular matrix times an upper triangular matrix with a diagonal matrix sandwiched in between. So that's kind of the big picture. Uh, first, we're going to start with a matrix A that, uh, suppose if matrix A can be put in row echelon form without using row interchanges. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. Uh, row echelon form means below all the pivots, there's only zeros. And the pivots work their way down and to the right as you go across the matrix. Um, saying A can be put in a row echelon form without using row interchanges means as you do the row reduction, the pivots will appear in the right place. You won't have to swap any rows to get a non-zero entry uh, in a particular location. So that's quite a, quite a constraint on matrix A to say that it can be put in row echelon form without row interchanges and probably something not easily recognized until you actually try to row reduce matrix A. Um, we'll overcome that constraint on matrix A before we're done. And we'll have to, what we'll do is we'll isolate where the row interchanges occur. But suppose you have such a matrix, you're going to put it in row echelon form. Okay, we got three row operations. Row interchange, but we're not using that one because we don't need to. Multiplying a row by a scalar, non-zero scalar. We'd need that if we wanted the pivots maybe to be one. That's where we go through and divide by whatever the value of the pivot is in a particular row, making the pivot in the new matrix one. But we're going for row echelon form, not reduced row echelon form. So I don't care what the pivots are, uh, just non-zero. Um, so we don't really need the uh, multiplication of a row by a scalar. So that just leaves uh, row addition, the third uh, elementary row operation. So what we're saying really by saying this is matrix A can put, be put in row echelon form only using row addition. So the only elementary row operation needed is row addition. So we can take matrix A, put it in row echelon form, only using row addition. So that means we can take matrix A and perform a sequence of elementary row operations, in this case, just row addition, that turns matrix A into a row equivalent matrix, call it U, in row echelon form. If a matrix is in row echelon form, then it's an upper triangular matrix. Uh, we have these ideas of upper and lower triangular defined for matrices that aren't necessarily square, something sort of new probably in the upper level class that you wouldn't encounter in linear algebra. I just talk about the main diagonal and entries of above or below that all being zeros. So if we put matrix A in row echelon form, that will mean we've converted it into a row equivalent um, form of a matrix U, which is upper triangular. Only zero entries below the diagonal, possibly on the diagonal, possibly above the diagonal, but definitely only zero entries below the diagonal. Also, we're not going to use row interchange because we don't need to. We're not going to <clears throat> multiply rows by constants because we don't need to do that either if we're just going for row echelon form. So by only using the row addition, we're never going to modify the diagonal entries of matrix A, 
And so the diagonals of this matrix U will be the same as the diagonal entries of matrix A. Uh, here's a little theory to quote. Um, some of this is presented more at a, well, think about how you do the row reductions uh, type of argument, because it is notes from sophomore linear algebra largely. All right, so each of these elementary matrices, in fact, they're of this form, E sub PSQ. <clears throat> I introduced this E sub PSQ notation, so maybe the only place you see it. Uh, but I've used that to indicate that we've taken row P and added S times row Q to row P. So that's what the PSQ represents in that notation that I made up. Also, when we're doing this, we're only applying those operations when P is greater than Q. So think how you deal with the row reduction of a matrix. Uh, you start probably with the upper left entry, the one, one entry. And then you use that if it's not zero, it will be if we don't need row interchanges, unless the whole first column is zero, uh, but for the sake of conversation and argument, suppose the one, one entry <clears throat> in matrix A is not zero. You're gonna use it to eliminate all the entries below it. So you're gonna use row one to eliminate the first entry in all the rows below it. The rows below it, row P, will be having row P greater than one, uh, P greater than one, when we take that first entry and use it to eliminate stuff below. When I say below, I mean the row number is greater than the row number of the the qth row that we're using to do the elimination. So I'll use the first row to fix the first column by fixing, making zero, all the first entries in the first column uh, throughout row two through row, uh, what do we have, n rows here? We'll at some point comment matrix A is n by n. So we're using the first row to fix the first column by getting zeros in the first entry of all the rows below it. So we do have P greater than Q. And then we'll move down and to the right, and then we'll eliminate um, things below that next pivot. Always below. The always eliminating things below pivots is always doing this type of operation where P is greater than Q. That's essential to get in the, the lower triangular matrix L. All right, let's uh, state a theorem. And then we'll look at the proof, and the proof will kind of mechanically tell you how to do this. It says if A is an n by n matrix, which can be put in row echelon form without interchanging rows, then there's a lower triangular n by n matrix L with entries of one on the diagonal and an upper triangular n by m matrix U such that A equals L times U. A couple of things, uh, L is a square matrix, so I can talk about inverses in connection with matrix L. Um, U is the same size as matrix A. In fact, we're going to show that uh, U is row equivalent to matrix A because it's going to be the U that we introduced up here, in fact. Um, and when I multiply L by U, we do indeed get an N by M matrix. So matrix A need not be square. Matrix U need not be square. Matrix L is square. Matrix L is lower triangular, matrix U is upper triangular, matrix L has ones along the diagonal, um, it's lower triangular with ones along the diagonal, it's determinant is one, it's an invertible matrix. Uh, let's go ahead and read the next definition, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, before we look at the proof. It says for N by N matrix A, which can be put in row echelon form without row interchanges, this factorization, writing A as L times U, is an, <clears throat> is an LU factorization of matrix A, where L is lower triangular, U is upper triangular, and L had ones along the diagonal, at least in, in the, for now. We'll maybe make some changes uh, when we look at L, D, U, decompositions. But for now, ones along the diagonal of L, uh, diagonal of U is the same as a diagonal of matrix A we saw. We commented earlier. Let's look at the proof as observed. That will actually tell you how to do the computations. We'll illustrate this with a little example also. 
Okay, uh, we just argued that we can take matrix A, perform a sequence of elementary row operations, row addition, each of them, to convert A into a uh, row echelon form, that's an upper triangular version of uh, matrix A, row equivalent to matrix A and upper triangular. Each of these elementary matrices, each of these ESMIs we've introduced here, is associated with the row operation of row addition. Okay. Um, U is upper triangular, the row operations uh, need only involve adding a multiple of one row to another. Yeah, so as argued above. Um, if we wanted uh, maybe reduced row echelon form, whole different story. I'll need to uh, make sure pivots are one. So I'd have to go through and modify U by changing its pivots to one. And we'd also have to have zeros above the main diagonal if we went for reduced row echelon form. And that's going to mess up everything we're doing here. So we only have row operations of the form. Row P is replaced with row P plus S times row Q for some S and P is greater than Q as argued above. That's because we're making upper triangular matrix U, not um, a reduced row echelon form of matrix A. Uh, the elementary matrix associated with each of these type of row operations is as follows. Okay, every elementary row operation can be represented by an elementary matrix. You take the identity matrix, and you do to it whatever elementary row operation you're trying to represent with a matrix. So when we take an n by n identity matrix and we do this to it, not much changes because there's zeros all over the place except along the diagonal. So what happens when you apply uh, row P is replaced with row P plus S times row Q, what you get for an elementary matrix representing that is a matrix whose entries are the same as the entries in the identity matrix, except in one place. In entry PQ, this parameter S will appear. And we'll illustrate this with an example here shortly. Uh, if you wanted to find the inverse of that elementary matrix, all elementary matrices are invertible, then we'd consider um, undoing this elementary row operation. How do you undo adding S times row Q to row P by subtracting S times row Q from row P. So the elementary matrix corresponding to the inverse of the elementary matrix with PQ as its entry S is an elementary matrix with its PQ entry as negative S. Easy to invert elementary matrices. And um, when I look at the elementary matrix representing an inverse, of one of these up here. It's the identity everywhere except in the PQ entry where it has an entry of negative S. All right, so it looks like the identity except in the PQ entry. Remember P is greater than Q? So each of these little E sub I inverses, they're lower triangular. They got zeros above the diagonal. They got ones on the diagonal, below the diagonal, doesn't matter if I'm claiming they're lower triangular. They got zeros above the diagonal. They're lower triangular. Yeah, they got ones along the diagonal because of the way they're constructed. And they've got one non-zero element below the diagonal. I actually know where it is. It's in entry PQ. But the point is, each of these E sub I's is lower triangular. Uh, or E sub I inverses, the E sub I's as well. Each of these matrices is lower triangular. Their inverses are all lower triangular. And hey, I know what happens when you multiply two lower triangular matrices together. Uh, we had the relationship that A, when all these elementary matrices were multiplied on the left to A, we produced upper triangular matrix U, row echelon form of matrix A, U, if you like. So take these elementary matrices, invert them, move them to the other side of the equation, basically solve this for matrix A. Easy enough, because all of those are invertible. And we get A is E1 inverse, E2 inverse, blah, 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 up to E sub H inverse, times just upper triangular matrix U. Hey, theorem 3.2.1 part four, 
our result said the product of uh, square, lower triangular matrices is again lower triangular. These are elementary matrices. Elementary matrices are always square. You take an identity matrix, square, of course, identity matrix, and perform row operations on it. So elementary matrices are always square. Since all the inverses are lower triangular, then the product is lower triangular. So set L equal to that product of inverses. L is lower triangular. A equals L times U. It's exactly what we have up here. And there you go, that, that was the claim. We can write A as L times U, where U is upper triangular, check, row, row echelon form of matrix A. L is lower triangular, check, uh, all the little E sub I inverse thingies were um, lower triangular, so their product is lower triangular, so L is lower triangular. Uh, by the way, we didn't request this, but the diagonal entries on matrix L, they're all ones. Think what you did when you produced these inverses. All of these had ones along the diagonal. They just had some non-zero entries, had one non-zero entry each below the main diagonal. But <clears throat> diagonal entries are all one. And in L, the diagonal entries are all one. That wasn't claimed, but it's, it's the case. Back to the notes. Let's, uh, yeah, let's illustrate that with an example. Uh, the proof that we just saw actually tells you how to uh, how to go through and do the computations. It gives an algorithm uh, for finding an LUD composition, and here's what we do. Uh, consider this matrix A. Uh, we're going to find a bunch of inverse matrices, uh, or a bunch of elementary matrices and their inverses. Uh, so let me bring up a three by three identity as well. Uh, if this were not square, we'd use the number of rows to determine what size identity to use. <clears throat> but here's a, for the sake of illustration, a square matrix. We haven't done many computations in this class of this sort, but this is possibly a new topic for you. So we're going to take matrix A and row reduce it. Uh, let's use uh, the one entry here to get zero here first. Okay, that'd be row two goes to row two minus two times row one. That'd give us a zero there as desired. Next, let's use the one to eliminate the negative one. That's just row addition. Row three plus row one gives us a zero there. And as I've tried to word it, I'd say, so I probably can't highly, I can't highlight just the first column. The first column is like fixed. I've got a pivot here. It happens to be one. It could not be one and I wouldn't care. The important thing is it's got zeros below it. So we're done with the first column. So we move down and over, find the next pivot, it's this two. I wanna get zeros below that two. So we need to take row three and subtract three times row two. Row three goes to row three minus three times row two, gets a zero there, we're done. Uh, this is a row echelon form of matrix A. Uh, the pivots aren't one. Okay, so it ain't reduced row echelon form. If it was, the pivots would be one and there'd be zeros above the pivots. Not interested in that. It's a row echelon form. We'll call this matrix U. Okay, now we want to find the <clears throat> inverse matrix of the elementary matrix, <clears throat> excuse me, that corresponds to each of these operations. So we're interested in the inverse matrix associated with the elementary matrix where we took row two and subtracted two times row one. Well, the inverse matrix would be the elementary matrix associated with undoing that elementary row operation. How do you undo subtracting twice row one from row two? Add twice row one to row two. Do that to the identity matrix and that'll give you the inverse matrix E sub one inverse. E sub 1 being the elementary matrix associated with the row operation done to matrix A. As we've seen, it's actually the inverses we're interested in. Okay, uh, so do that. Um, next, we had uh, row 3 added to row 1. To undo that, we would take row 3 minus row 1. The elementary matrix associated with that picks up a negative 1 here. Uh, we were adding twice row one, we pick up a two here. We're just picking up these individual S values below the diagonal. That's what we saw uh, from the argument above. D 
down here we're uh, let's see taking row three minus three times row two so on this side we'll take row three plus three times row two um, row three three times row two from an identity matrix introduces a three there so you get these scalars introduced uh, below the diagonal these are the inverse matrices uh, we claimed that we would take u to be this row echelon form of matrix A. We take L to be the product E1 inverse through E3 inverse when, when indexed like this. Multiply those together, it will produce this matrix here. Trust me on that arithmetic. And you can verify that if you'll multiply this L matrix, which is indeed um, lower triangular, zeros above the diagonal. Oh yeah, one's along the diagonal, told you so because it's a product of these elementary matrices, all of which will have ones on the diagonals. So we keep the ones on the diagonals there. Uh, over here, we got matrix U. You multiply L by U, you'll, it, it gives you matrix A. So the arithmetic checks. So there's how to find an LU decomposition. Um, we're gonna modify that a little bit and look at LDU composition or LDU factorizations or decompositions. Uh, now, uh, if A equals LU, where the diagonal entries of Ls are all ones, as, as we've had with our process, we could get ones along the diagonal of matrix U as well. But uh, to keep the books balanced, we'll have to insert some other things. Uh, we can multiply row i of matrix u by 1 over u sub i i, assuming it's a diagonal entry we're interested in, uh, to produce an upper triangular matrix u star, and then the diagonal entries of that will be 1s. Uh, but to keep the books balanced, we need to put a uh, multiple of u sub i i somewhere in there, and we're going to put it in a diagonal matrix D. So we'll define uh, n by n diagonal matrix D with entries u sub i i. So D sub i i equals u sub i i. Uh, then if we'll take matrix D, that's matrix u star, we've divided uh, assuming we didn't have zeros, we've divided along the diagonal by uh, the u sub i i entries to create u star, and then we're just putting them back by multiplying by the appropriate size diagonal matrix here. So that leads to the situation where we get a written as l times a diagonal matrix times an upper, uh, sorry, l, a lower triangular matrix, times a diagonal matrix D times U star, an upper triangular matrix, an upper triangular matrix that has ones along the diagonal. Uh, provided, right, we didn't do any division by zero. So if this is permissible, then we can write uh, matrix A as L, D, U star. L and U having ones along the diagonal. Um, so there are some constraints on when that can be done <clears throat> for us so far. In addition, we need to have um, A such that it can be put in row echelon form without using row interchanges. The next theorem says, well, when this can be done, then that decomposition is unique. So it gives us a, a uniqueness type result. It says let A be a square matrix. When a factorization, LDU exists, where L is lower triangular with ones along the main diagonal. Okay, we're good with that, provided the thing about um, uh, no row interchanges with matrix A, but we're, we're assuming we get this kind of factorization. Uh, U is upper triangular with diagonal entries along, uh, diagonal entries of one. So diagonal entries in L and U are both ones. D some diagonal matrix. Uh, notice we started with square matrix A, so these will all be square matrices. If you can write A equals LDU, lower triangular, one's on the diagonal, upper triangular, one's on the diagonal, and D, just a diagonal matrix, uh, non-zero entries along the diagonal. We're going to talk about its inverse. Then the claim is that such a factorization is unique. So it's a uniqueness claim. Let's go through proof of that because it's fairly straightforward. You assume there's two and show they're the same. So suppose matrix A can be written as L1, D1, U1, and as L2, D2, U2. 
for two factorizations satisfying these hypotheses. Okay, uh, we've got then L, U, and D with the subscripts. They're all square matrices. Uh, L and U have ones along their diagonals. If you like, their determinant is one and they're invertible. Uh, D has a main diagonal with non-zero entries. Okay, its determinant then is non-zero and it's invertible too. Uh, so each of these LUD matrices or the subscripted ones, these things are all invertible. So we can consider L1 inverse and L2 inverse. Uh, inverses of lower triangular matrices are, all, are also lower triangular. Uh, it follows from the definition of matrix multiplication. Um, D1 inverse. D2 inverse, these are also diagonal. The inverse of an invertible diagonal matrix is a diagonal matrix. These are square. Uh, U1 inverse, U2 inverse, uh, these are also upper triangular. Inverses of upper triangular matrices are upper triangular. Uh, so that gives us some information. Uh, first off, the inverses exist. The inverses are similar to the they share properties with, similar as a particular meaning, they share properties with um, their uninverted colleagues. For example, L1's lower triangular, so is L1 inverse. Diagonals have inverses that are diagonal. Upper triangular have inverses that are upper triangular. Okay, um, the diagonal entries of L1, L2, U1, U2, and their inverses. Um, these are all Diagonal entries of one, so their inverses satisfy the same property because they are upper triangular or lower triangular or diagonal. So we got a bunch of matrices with ones along the diagonals. The only one that isn't is a D matrices. Okay, so we assumed A had these two representations. Knowing the existence of these diagonals and, and the location of all these ones, we get the following. Um, let's concentrate on these uh, this equality here, let's take the L2 to the other side and get an L2 inverse times L1. Let's take the D1, U1 to this side, go, they'll appear on the right with their inverses. So the U1 goes to the other side as U1 inverse followed by D1 and a D1 inverse and those will appear on the right hand side. So we can write L2 inverse times L1 is D2, U2, U1 inverse, D1 inverse. What we've done, the reason we did it this way is left-hand side, that's a product of lower triangular matrices. So the left-hand side is lower triangular as we observed um, in the proof of the previous result. Right-hand side, uh, we've got a diagonal matrix, two upper triangular matrices, and a diagonal matrix. Well, diagonal matrices are upper triangular or lower triangular as well. So I take advantage and say, this is a product of four upper triangular matrices. Okay, so um, the left-hand side is lower triangular. The right-hand side is upper triangular. All right. Um, well, the only way that can happen, the only way we can get this equality uh, is if these are actually both diagonal matrices. If this is lower triangular, this is upper triangular, and they're equal, they're both upper and lower triangular, meaning there's zeros above the diagonal and zeros below the diagonal for both sides. Okay, um, that boils down then to the situation that their diagonal entries must be the same. But wait a second, we said L1's got ones along the diagonal, there it is right there, so it's inverse, so the inverse of one of those lower triangular matrices, the L2 inverse, it's also got ones along the diagonal. So we've got ones along the diagonal here, ones along the diagonal here, L1 and L2 inverse are both lower triangular. But when I multiply them together, I'm getting a diagonal matrix. That diagonal matrix must have all ones along the diagonal. L2 inverse times L1, that must be an identity matrix. All this stuff here, being equal must also be an n by n diagonal matrix. Uh, so L2 inverse times L1 equals an identity. Multiply both sides by L2 to draw the conclusion L1 equals L2. Uh, similarly, we can draw the same conclusion with the U1, U2 inverses. Uh, we could uh, 
take uh, what? Take the original. Yeah, take the original equation. Get u1 and u2 inverse on one side. Move the l1 d1 so the other side is inverse. It's the same idea. And the same thing. You'll draw the same conclusion that u1 equals u2, and you'll draw the same conclusion that d1 equals d2 in a similar way. So L1 and L2 are the same, U1, U2 are the same, D1, D2 are the same. The factorization in this form is unique. Back to the notes. Uh, we have from that previous result, uh, in particular say if uh, uh, we take a square matrix, which can be put in row echelon form without interchanging rows, then you know we have a technique by which we can write A equals L times U, and we'll have ones along the diagonal. Um, a diagonal of L. So uh, such factorizations must be unique. Take A equals um, LDU, where D is the identity, and then you've got an LDU decomposition. We put an identity matrix there. Um, that doesn't modify the uh, L matrix, the U matrix. I mean, there are certain conditions that are imposed on it, but we get uniqueness of um, these type of decompositions, provided we get ones along the diagonal of L. And I can take this diagonal matrix I and do some modifications to have the U matrix with um, ones along the diagonal, as we did upstairs. So what if you do need to use row interchanges? Uh, we're gonna isolate those with a permutation matrix. And I could probably have a conversation about um, a basis for the row space. Uh, I'm looking for a basis of the row space using the rows of matrix A. Uh, if it happens to be the first R rows of matrix A, if A is of rank R, say, then you've got linearly independent um, R, linearly independent rows at the top of matrix A. If that's the case, you wouldn't have needed row interchanges. So I can kind of put my finger on when you need the row interchanges and when you don't. If A is of um, rank R in the first R rows are not linearly independent, you're gonna have to move some stuff around. So that, that kind of puts a finger on when you need to do perm permutings of rows. But um, if we need to move the rows around, then we could do it with an appropriate permutation matrix multiplied on the left. I take a permutation matrix, a product of elementary permutation matrices, permutation matrices, just swap rows. I could swap the rows of A around using that permutation matrix, take P times A, and bring the linearly independent rows of A to the top. Then we wouldn't need any more row interchanges, uh, and we could apply the first result we saw. So theorem 5.6.c says, uh, let A be an n by n matrix, uh, which can be put in row echelon form. Then there exists an n by n permutation matrix P, an n by n lower triangular matrix L, with diagonal entries one, by the way, and an n by n upper triangular matrix U, such that uh, P times A equals LU. All right, so we had, to, um, we had to move the rows of matrix A around first to get it into a matrix P times A that could be put in row echelon form without using any row operations. Well, I mean, you, you did the, the row interchanges, sorry, row interchanges, I should say. We, we stuffed all those row interchanges in, in matrix P. Uh, and so I don't need to swap rows anymore. So this new matrix then has an LU decomposition, LU factorization. Uh, as an example, uh, take this three by three matrix A. Let's try to, uh, try to put it in row echelon form without swapping rows, but it doesn't work. We'll use uh, this one to eliminate this negative two and to eliminate this two. Do those two operations, it leaves you down here. Okay, and now uh, you're stuck in terms of putting that in row echelon form unless you can swap rows. Uh, we need to swap the second and the third rows. We need to interchange those two. So introduce a permutation matrix P that swaps those two rows. Uh, swap the two rows in a three by three identity. Had we swapped 
these two rows in matrix A with the manipulations we've done, that would correspond to swapping these two rows down here. We haven't had any, any other row swappings or, or any involved manipulations. We've only used the row addition thing. Uh, so if we'll take, this as a permutation matrix, then we can write P times A then as L times U. Uh, the U matrix will be as described. We'd have to swap the second and third rows to get this. The L matrix would be based on um, the elementary row operations, actually the inverses of the elementary row operations. Uh, as above, we get this as the L matrix. Notice there's ones along the diagonal. And if we'll uh, take this L matrix times this U matrix, Indeed, uh, it does give you uh, matrix P times matrix A. And let's see, we got one more. Yeah, a little uh, summary on this. Uh, theorem 5.6 told us you got an N by N matrix, uh, which can be put in row echelon form without interchanging rows. So that was a constraint in the first theorem. Then there's an LU factorization. Theorem 5.6 said, well, if you've got an uh, N by M matrix, um, maybe you do need the row interchanges, then there's a permutation matrix, such P, such that P times A has an LU factorization. Uh, some things we didn't directly address. Uh, are, there, uh, are there square non-singular matrices uh, which don't have LU factorizations, say? Uh, yeah, consider this matrix. That doesn't itself have an LU factorization. Right, I, I need to swap the rows. It's two by two, it's only got two rows. I need to swap the rows to do my LU factorization stuff. So this matrix itself doesn't have an LU factorization. Now I could multiply it by a matrix and swap the two rows, the interchange of the first two rows, which in fact is this matrix. Um, and that would have an LU factorization. But here's an example of a matrix where uh, it doesn't fit the mold. It doesn't fit the hypotheses of theorem 5.6.8. So it itself doesn't have an LU decomposition. Uh, an example of a non-square matrix, and it's non-full rank, uh, that does have an LU decomposition is the following. So we can have this conversation in terms of invertible matrices as well. Uh, of course, they got to be square for that conversation. Uh, Gentle mentions this as an example of a um, non-square, non-full rank. Uh, it have to be uh, what we consider row rank in this case because it's two by three, two rows, three columns. Uh, but it's only rank one, as you can see. Uh, this matrix, it's got an LU decomposition. In fact, this matrix is already in uh, row echelon form. So we'll multiply it on the left, say, by a two by two identity matrix. Identity matrices are lower triangular. And here's an example then um, of a matrix with an LU decomposition, a rather trivial example, really. Um, but it's a, it's a non-square, non-full rank matrix. The example we had above those that involve full rank matrices of both of these, uh, both this example and the previous one. As you can see, when we put it in row echelon form, we had, in each case, we had three pivots. So that'll do for our exploration of LU factorizations and LDU factorizations. Uh, we've got two more factorizations to address in chapter five, uh, QR factorizations, and then um, some things involving um, non-negative determinant matrices. We'll do some factorizations of those as well. Uh, we'll see you in the next section so shortly, and we'll do QR factorizations. Have a nice day.